Hey everyone, uh, we're gonna give folks a minute or two to filter in and then we'll get going. While we are waiting, I would like to welcome those of you who are already here to the 2024 Great Decision Speaker Series, uh, sponsored by the World Affairs Council of St. Louis and UMSL Global, the International Affairs Office uh, at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. Uh, UMSL Global has been a partner and sponsor of this speaker series for many years, and it is my and our pleasure to welcome you here today. Uh, the World Affairs Council uh, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization with local chapters across the U.S. It is a 501c3 nonprofit, nonpartisan membership organization, connects the citizens of the St. Louis region to the world. Uh, founded in 1948, their mission is to offer programs that promote understanding, engagement, relationships, and leadership in world affairs. Uh, and they rely on donations from the community and have annual memberships that are available. So please support uh, their mission and that organization by becoming a member today. Uh, today, we're going to be focused on the U.S.-China trade rivalry, and we are pleased and very grateful to welcome Claire Chu, who is a principal China analyst at Jane's in Washington, D.C., her research uh, on the Jane's geoeconomic influence and threat intelligence team focuses on the national security implications of China's global economic activity, uh, including foreign direct investment and other capital flows, as well as the role of the private sector in China's economic and financial statecraft. She's also a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub, a counselor to the Project 2049 Institute's China Economic and Strategy Initiative, She's testified before Congress uh, about the U.S.-China economic and security issues, and her commentary has been featured in major media outlets in the U.S., Europe, and Asia, including the New York Times, the Financial Times, Bloomberg, and Nikkei Asia. Claire, thank you so much for being here. We are pleased to welcome you, and I'm very sorry for my dog that is uh, down here at the bottom of my screen. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you again for being here. Great. Thanks again for having me, Stephen. It's great to speak to this group, and it's such a timely topic. So um, I have a PowerPoint, but I'm going to also just start by giving a little bit of an overview of my background and how I ended up in this space. So when I first started in the China space, well, for a shorter story, um, I was in more of the national security defense space in D.C., um, and at the time, say, it was like 20... 2012, 2016, the focus on China was really, it really centered on China from the military angle and only from the military angle, right? When we were talking about China, it was about the South China Sea, air sea battle. We were talking about China's, you know, A2AD capabilities in the Asia Pacific. And that was really, that was really the conversation. Um, and so I ended up working in Berlin briefly at the Mercator Institute for China Studies, where you know, due to the lack of standing military, the, the focus on China wasn't so much centered on the defense capabilities as much as on China's economic comp competitiveness, China's um, manufacturing uh, capabilities on China as a technological competitor, right? And that was when Made in China 2025 came out in around 2016, 2017. I mean, it kind of shifted how a lot of people were talking and thinking about China. And again, in Europe, the conversation was very different from the States. There was a lot of concern about Chinese um, investment, greenfield and brownfield investment in the EU. And in the US, that conversation was in the background, but still, still quite nascent. So when I came back to DC, I wanted to find a place where I could work on both issues. And that's where I ended up landing and kind of carved out this career, um, looking at China's again, overseas economic activities, China's um, commercial strategies, China's private sector, and how all of these actors help the Chinese government to achieve state objectives, strategic goals, um, despite being ostensibly, again, private, which is very different from how a lot of Western companies or Western observers understand, you know, the separation between, you know, the, gov the government and uh, the private sector. And so to also this conversation is so is it's so interesting to me increasingly because it's it's also bittersweet right um for the, the fact that everyone right now is talking about china i think it, in the us at least with us government china is recognized as really a key with a key competitor near peer competitor um the language has changed right there is bipartisan bicameral agreement on where the us and china stand tensions are fraught um so i'm i'm so glad that you're all interested you know in this topic um and it's again, I'm I'm hoping that 
you know, this year, by the end of the year, there's some more clarity, you know, on, on where things lie. But un until then, you know, this, I think this conversation will continue to be really relevant. And so the, the title, I think, of today's session was U.S.-China Trade Rivalry. And since that's just a big, that's such a big topic, I'm going to focus a little bit more on um, China's access to U.S. technology and investment. And that's been a conversation that's really ramped up in the last six years or so um, and how the U.S. is trying to counter this. So you can next slide, please. I'll start by talking a little bit about China's party state capitalism and what makes China's economy so different from the U.S. And this isn't going to be focused so much on economics per se, but how China controls or influences the state economy. Next slide, please. So the Chinese government has the broad authority to direct its commercial actors, their behavior, including private sector companies, which are ultimately controlled, controllable by the government under national laws and regulations. I'll get into some of those in the next slide. Um, but economic stability, national security, and really the central government's strategic, most important objectives are all more important, and they're elevated above profit-seeking commercial interests. And so this means that industrial policies create state monopolies, and this is by design. We have national champions that in the U.S. we've all heard of, like Huawei, for example, is absolutely a state champion in the tech sector um, that received preferential treatment, state incentives to expand overseas and to invest overseas and to operate you know, in new markets. And if we have the next slide, please. Some of the, the ways in which China is able to do this or to exert this influence and in some circumstances control, um, it's through a combination of legal mechanisms, financial instruments, regulatory actions, and government directives. So I can't won't get into everything, but some that I feel are more key, most key to this discussion include the National Intelligence Law, which was introduced in 2017, under which all organizations, including companies, you know, entities, um, are required to support or assist with national intelligence efforts in accordance to national law. And that means they are required to protect national trade secrets or work secrets, um, but also to share information as required. There's also the National Cybersecurity Law, which is enacted a year before 2016, that requires network operators to store select data with China and also allows Chinese authorities to spot check companies' network operations. And then along the lines of cybersecurity, a more recent law, the data security law was enacted in 2021, um, which requires more strict data localization for companies operating in China to store their data in China, including uh, private individuals' information in China, um, as well as export protection requirements of data. And so as, as a company operating in China, you know, it it's, it's different whether you're a joint venture, a foreign company, or a Chinese company, right? If you're a, a Chinese company, um, the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, has a system of special management shares, which some of you may have you know, seen in the news as golden shares, um, which allow them to monitor specifically media technology companies. Um, and it gives, it, it's a relatively small stake in a company, but allows the government to have, in some circumstances, a veto power or greater decision-making authorities. And also there are now state-owned capital investment companies private and also guidance funds in China, which invest in private enterprises in key strategic industries. And I keep saying key strategic industries, we'll also get into that a little bit, but largely we're talking about advanced manufacturing, high tech, advanced science and technology, right? Um, a lot, a lot of um, the technology that the U.S. is trying to safeguard right now from China. And so in terms of regulatory actions, um, there has been a slew of them over the past few years, but in in particular, the CSRC, the China Securities Regulatory Commission, which is China's equivalent of the United States SEC, um, has now is now preventing IPOs or companies going public in specific sectors that are non-strategic, right? So companies that might be in the retail or um, alcohol industry, right, education industry aren't in some cases, this is reportedly um, allowed to IPO because the government wants to steer funding for IP financing for IPOs towards strategic industries, again, like manu advanced manufacturing or high tech, information technology, so on and so forth. Um, there are also now, you know, now situations in China and also Hong Kong where companies that want to go public and their lawyers aren't allowed to make negative statements about China's laws, policies, economic situation, political situation. Um, in the past, this was, at least in Hong Kong, part of every listing 
prospectus or document, right? Companies had to disclose if there were material risks particular to doing business in China. For example, um, instability of like the government, right? For example, um, data and privacy considerations that would affect business and could affect shareholders' positions. Um, but again, as of, I mean, not that long ago, maybe a year or so, uh, this is no longer allowed. And also the party state, again, the Chinese Communist Party is embedded in commercial decision-making through several processes. And we don't necessarily have time to get into all of that now, but this could include embedding cadres or government officials in a private company um, in order to help guide decision-making, help communicate government policy, right? Um, there's a level of oversight, um, but also integrating vice versa, um, sort of exchange programs between government and private sector, which is again, relatively, um, it's unheard of, I think in the United States, um, but this, this uh, divide between public private is not so clear in China. So next slide, please. So next, another, I think another relevant topic to get to is um, China's military civil fusion initiative, which I'm sure a lot of you have also been following along, uh, along with. And I think this is also important when we're taking into consideration how China operates and how the economy operates, right? And how it's not all just private companies, but specifically you're talking about military industrial companies or science and technology companies. It's a very different situation in terms of how how they can operate and their and what it means for these companies to have access to foreign technologies, access to foreign capital, access to foreign, you know, um, employees and talents, and bringing them back to China. Um, and so, if we go to the next slide, so just to go back a little bit more, um, military civil fusion. I think technically. At its core is just integrating the country's resources, China's resources, in order to build the world's most technolog technologically advanced military, ideally by 2049, while achieving also parallel economic growth, right? The, the point of military civil fusion or MCF is to significantly reduce the costs of development of technology, R&D, production, manufacturing, and this allows for greater focus on innovation, specifically indigenous innovation, next generation innovation, in order for China to catch up with first mover states like the United States, for example, to overcome technical obstacles and to become really competitive and be able to export to new markets overseas. And so when we're talking about military civil fusion, just wanna clarify the military, it's not just the military per se, you know, the armed forces, um, but also military industrial enterprises that are responsible for, you know, state backed or state directed R&D, production of weapons and equipment. And for civilian, not just private enterprises, but also state-owned enterprises, universities, research institutes, um, and really any unit outside of the military, military industrial base. Next slide, please. And when we're talking about military civil fusion, of course, it's a really wide range of interests that Chinese government has, but most most specifically, it's national defense, of course, science and technology, technology advancement, which spans six major areas, right? There's nuclear, aerospace, aviation, ships, weapons, military electronics. And within those areas of science and technology, there are about a dozen or so that have been articulated as ex especially, you know, prior prioritized for China. And that includes autonomous, unmanned, integrated technology for ships. That includes unmanned surface vessels, unmanned submarines, helicopters. Right. Also, there's a lot of interest in control technology for small UAVs, um, UAVs being unmanned aerial vehicles or drones that can navigate complex urban environments. And you've seen how drones have been very, very um, key to you know, the, the crisis right now in Ukraine, especially be able to operate in city environments. And that's something China is very interested in. And also overall, when we're talking about dual use technologies and the development of dual use, dual use technologies, um, China is pursuing you know, this development through two primary means. So there is military to civil conversion, right? And also civil to military conversion. It goes both ways. So when we talk about military to civil conversion, um, that's the commercialization of military technologies for civilian applications. So a great example of this is the Beidou Navigation Satellite System, BNSS, which is China's response to GPS. And um, the GPS, uh, you know, the U.S., of course, we we all use it as civilians, right? We have in our phones, we talk about GPS and we're, you know, autonomous with driving, you know, with autonomous vehicles, GPS is really important for geolocation. 
Um, but with much like Beidou, Beidou began as a military application, right? Beidou is able to, which goes both ways, is able to provide guidance and positioning for missiles and for high precision strike weapons. But again, like GPS is now integrated to the civilian market and used for 5G, you know, vehicles, other applications. And the other way around, we're talking about civil to military integration, the private sector that becomes involved in military related work. So a lot of times this happens through, you know, having a private company acquire military assets, acquiring a military industrial company or acquiring certain capabilities um, and then become, becoming cleared or licensed to participate in high tech defense projects. And the Chinese government has been, you know, enacting new policies to try to lower that threshold to make it easier for private companies to bid for defense projects or to become cleared. Next slide, please. And the, really the goal of a lot of MCF, again, is overall development, but part of that goal is also accessing foreign technology and resources in order to develop, right? And because Beijing considers itself a little bit behind when it comes to innovation technology, right? It wasn't in the first wave of, say, software development, um, but it wants to be in the next wave of, say, quantum computing. Um, they're really interested in taking advantage of existing global resources and science and technology that has been developed by other countries to jumpstart domestic innovation. And so military civil fusion allows China a pathway to access foreign military industrial knowledge at a relatively low commercial cost, right? So the Chinese government goes, again, goes both ways, encourages domestic firms to invest overseas, including the United States, in foreign companies that specialize in advanced high-tech and manufacturing. Other way around, the Chinese government encourages, incentivizes foreign companies, like U.S. companies, to invest in manufacture in China, where labor is relatively you know, less expensive, but also there are barriers to entry, including licensing requirements in what we could consider a market for technology exchange. And there are a lot of other ways where this kind of tech transfer happens, whether you know it's required by the Chinese government in some sort of deal, in an agreement, um, or just through the natural processes of joint R&D. But by bringing in these advanced science technology concepts from overseas, it's not just the technology, right? You're also a lot of times bringing in talent, you're bringing in workers. There have been a lot of efforts to attract overseas talent to China and to Chinese companies. Um, to, for example, auto manufacturers are bringing in European um, talents to help develop China's domestic um, like auto aut autonomous driving and EV industries. And so China then is able to transform these global resources into internal R&D advantages, which is now a key concern for the U.S. and other Western governments, um, which have been expanding their policy toolkit to address these challenges and address this reality, which is really a reality that exponentially you know, grows um, over the last decade. So the next slide, please. I'll go over um, a couple of the different ways that the U.S. government is trying to address this issue. And there's a range, and this is nascent, right? I think this is really um, only kickstarted into high drive in the last say, six to eight years, maybe 10 years or so, that the U.S. has really been taking seriously, not just preventing access to technology, but also access to capital. Investment restrictions, for example, new types of sanctions we're seeing. Um, so it's, it's, it's an interesting time, but also we are still in a way, building the plane as we're flying it. We're still trying to figure out what works, figuring out you know, where authority should lie, figuring out um, how and when to expand these authorities, right? And what is effective. So the next slide, please. Some of the key investment screening mechanisms that the United States has, um, the main one, most people have heard of would be CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, which is an interagency committee chaired by the Treasury Department, although others, for example, Commerce, Park Defense, all have liaisons and teams that support CFIUS work. Um, and CFIUS is intended to oversee the national security risks of foreign direct investment in the United States. And it was founded or it was created, established in 1975, um, but was really um, kicked into, a, I think, its new era in 2018 with the passage of FIRMA, which is the Foreign Investment Review Risk Review Modernization Act. And FIRMA was intended to expand the scope and really broaden the role of CFIUS to address these new challenges we're seeing today. Um, for example, FIRMA expand, authorized in addition to the existing sectors that CIFI has covered, um, review of certain real estate transactions, leases, purchases, for example, that are within certain proximity to sensitive sites in the US. For example, military installations, government facilities, airports, and seaports. 
um, CFIUS was also expanded through thir through FIRMA to um, not just look at majority controlling stakes that Chinese companies or Russian companies or other foreign adversarial companies um, or foreign countries would invest in, in the U.S., but also minority stakes, which was, again, new, non-controlling investments, specifically in critical technologies and in infrastructure. And the most recent development, which is very nascent, is the introduction of outbound investment screening. This is something that for years, um, I think a lot of observers, analysts, uh, policymakers have been trying to figure out, you know, have been pushing forward because we're, of course, there's a concern about, for example, a Chinese company acquiring an American robotics company or an, you know, an American um, semiconductor company, right? And acquiring the know-how and the talent and the IP. Um, but there's also concern about US companies, for example, private equity firms, venture capital firms that are investing in Chinese high-tech development and supporting and subsidizing um, and having a, a stake in the continued success and expansion of China in like, critical areas, again, like advanced high tech and quantum computing or, you know, UAV development and things like that, surveillance technologies. And so in 2023, August 2023, there is a new program. This is the Apple Investment Program um, established under an executive order to address national security technologies in countries of concern, which is not I mean, it, it's not specifically China, but really, I think one of the, the key countries you know, of concern is, is going to be China. And so Treasury Department is now tasked and authorized to scope out this new program to figure out how exactly it would work. Um, the idea initially is that there are three sectors of concern, you know, that includes semiconductors and microelectronics, quantum computing, quantum information technologies, and also certain artificial intelligence systems. And the idea is this would expand in the future as the scope grows and as the uh, as the um, they refine kind of the the policy toolkit within this program. And again, I think this will be interagency, you know, as it's mapped out. But again, it's right now, still led by Treasury. And the part of this idea is um, they're having a lot of conversations in the past few years about not just not just companies, you know, Greenfield, Brownfield investments, but what is the role of Wall, Wall Street, right? What is the role of, you know, private capital? Again, I mentioned private equity, venture capital, but also hedge funds, um, joint ventures in kind of bolstering China's military capability. And so you know, the next slide, we'll kind of get into that space a little bit more. Some of the sanctions designations of blacklists that the U.S. Um, has in its in this policy toolkit uh, to counter Chinese China's foreign access of technology and you know and investment um, includes the Department of Defense's 1268 Chinese military companies list, and this is also this also has some history. Um, this was originally introduced in the 1990 fiscal year 1999 National Defense Authorization Act (NDAA). Um, there was a little section that required the Department of Defense to publish a list of identified Chinese military contractors. And I don't think the DOD had done so until a few years ago when this, and during the Trump administration, um, they were, they were called upon to, hey, you know, remember, remember this requirement, can we actually, you know, can we actually do this? Um, and so more, I think about a month or two ago, the DOD just added another tranche of companies to the list, but there are, I think, over, over a hundred now, um, there have been several tranches. And the problem with this list is that it currently does not have any direct sanctions or export control implications. However, there is another list, which is under Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control, or OFAC. And this list is the NSCMIC list, or the Non-SDN China Military Industrial Companies list. Um, and this list originally was one of the same with the 1260H list, um, but over a series of um, executive orders was kind of separated and put under Treasury's um, authority. And the NSCMIC list effectively restricts Chinese or U.S. investment in Chinese military companies that have been named to the list, requiring index funds and other passive investment managers um, to require to remove or divest those listed companies from their from their list or from their funds. And so this was then this is originally parsed out from 1260H, but it was imposed under executive order. Sorry, there's a lot of numbers. Um, 
13959 under President Trump. This is November 2020. And so again, this was the very first time that the US government had imposed any sort of investment restriction on national security basis on Wall Street. So there was a lot of pushback. I think some of the um, the index funds and some of the, the actors involved didn't, they wait until the very last day to actually make these changes to divest these companies because there was there were a lot of questions about whether or not this would actually move forward, you know, was um, how exactly would this with oversight work, right? And even now, this is still, it's still very early days, but it was expanded, this authority, and this was strengthened under President Biden in June 2021 with another executive order, which is 14032, that took this list of the NSCMIC list, added more companies, and expanded it to also include Chinese surveillance technology companies with a focus on surveillance in Xinjiang and other areas with human rights concerns. And that was when jurisdiction was moved from Department of Defense over to Treasury's OFAC. And so both, again, both DOD and Treasury now produce their independent lists of Chinese military companies. Um, there is significant overlap and inclusion in the DOD list, for example, doesn't guarantee inclusion in the OFAC list with the, with the sanctions, but it would suggest that the other authorities and the other agencies would take a great, take a second look at the companies and they would be subject to potentially future, um, future sanctions and impacts. So I know that was a little bit roundabout, um, but moving forward, the Bureau of Industry and Security at the Commerce Department also has its own, own list, the military end user list. And again, this is currently not harmonized with the other sanctions list, but the idea is um, the MEU list prohibits the export of certain items with potential dual use, so commercial and military use, so components and equipment, um, certain technologies, um, or otherwise strategic value to specific foreign entities in China, as well as Russia and Venezuela. Also, there is a covered list under the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, um, which now, as of 2019, started published, publishing a list of technologies, a list of communications, equipment, and services that are produced by um, companies that pose an acceptable risk to U.S. national security. So some of the items currently on the covered list include telecommunications equipment from Huawei, from ZTE, video surveillance technologies from Hikvision and Hytera, and also international telecommunication services from China Mobile. We move to the next slide. There are a couple other programs and resources that maybe don't as directly target Chinese acquisition or access to technology and investment, but I think really, really work in tandem with all these other um, all these other authorities to try to create a more full toolkit for policymakers to use. And that includes the FCC's uh, Secure Networks Reimbursement Program, which was enacted around the same time as the covered list. And so this program provides a tranche of money, I think originally it was $1.9 billion for small um, network providers in the United States to essentially do rip and replace, right? So remove specifically rip and replace of Huawei and I think it was uh, ZTE equipment. And so companies or network providers have to apply to the FCC to receive uh, tranches of funds in order to remove, replace, and dispose of Huawei and ZTE equipment. Um, I'm not, I think they're trying to get more funds for this program right now, but it's still active. There's also the XM Bank. So the Export Import Bank in the United States has a program called CTAP or the uh, China and Transformational Exports Program which was established about four years ago. So this is around its four year anniversary intended to help US exporters compete with Chinese manufacturers, especially in high tech industries. And specifically, I think there are about 11 or 13 industries that are covered. Um, biotech, quantum computing, semiconductors, renewable energy are among them. And then last but not least, there's the Chips and Science Act, which is also a very big news item um, enacted two years ago. And the Chips Act, provides also a, you know, a large sum of, of money um, to invest in domestic manufacturing, domestic semiconductor R&D, design, commercialization, but also to train and develop the United States STEM workforce with a focus on, of course, semiconductors. Um, there's also funding within the CHIPS Act for more cooperation between the U.S. and foreign partners in semiconductor supply chains. And so I'm going to finish here. I think this is the last slide. Um, leaving room for, for questions or for discussion. Um, but hopefully this was a helpful overview of, you know, 
what the U.S. has done so far. You know, what are the tools available in, in our in our kit right now to address this issue, and some of the the gaps or some of the the, the uh, opportunities we have moving forward to expand these capabilities or or to improve on them. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Claire. Uh, for our audience, if any of you have questions, please put them in the Q&A section uh, there on Zoom. Uh, while we wait on a few of those to come in, um, I thought I would uh, maybe get us started. Um, you mentioned a, a few things that sort of like made my eyebrows go up a little bit. Um, among them was uh, you mentioned sort of the, the changing situation in Hong Kong. And uh, I think uh, I can combine a couple of questions into one here. I believe a court in Hong Kong just ordered China's largest uh, real estate firm to dissolve due to their ongoing economic crisis like last week um, or in the past couple of weeks. Um, how does, I, I guess looking at all of this in, in, in totality, um, how does uh, the CCP and Xi Jinping, how do they handle sort of the short-sightedness, uh, or, or maybe it's not short-sighted, but it seems short-sighted to be hurting uh, so much investment into specific sectors when it seems like they did the same thing with uh, infrastructure development and real estate development and things like that a few years ago. Do you think they're learning any lessons or am I misreading the, the situation there? Yeah, and, and that's a great question. And honestly, I'm not I'm not really sure, you know, what the internal messaging is, what the strategy is. And we've seen a bit of doubling down. And we also, I think China is learning as they're as they go. Um, but at the at the end of the day, the the profitability and success of a lot of these companies really is secondary to to central interests. And with Hong Kong too, we've seen um a lot, I think, claims or concerns that Hong Kong is becoming a less attractive international hub. You know, is Hong Kong over? Which is maybe not, perhaps not the right right question to ask. You know, but is is Hong Kong the same as before? And I mean, Hong Kong has retained probably sixty percent of the businesses that were there before, right? A lot of the financial industry is still in Hong Kong, um, but also, I've heard suggestions from folks in China that maybe the idea wasn't to turn Hong to turn Shenzhen, for example, into Hong Kong into an open international environment. Maybe Shenzhen was the model all along and now the plan is to turn Hong Kong to Shenzhen, right? So I, I think the when some of the calculations are different, the priorities are different, it's hard to use, I think, Western rationalization to understand what the next steps might be or what the key concerns are for the central government. Great, thank you. Um, question from Bert Fullman in the audience. Uh, how do you see the U.S. and Europe competing uh, in the realm of the military civil fusion in general? Yeah, I think the, the U.S. specifically, and I can't speak to Europe as much, but the U.S. has um, been really focusing on more on the wiring uh, across from Washington to the Wall Street, but also Silicon Valley, right? We've seen more communication and joint projects and trying to leverage like collective strengths across all the industries to work together. There's also increased focus on working with allies in Europe. And so this is all this is all still relatively new. It's trying to figure out, again, figuring out the wiring, figuring the communication. Um, but the U.S. is also, I think, increasingly focusing on, I think, education, um, I think that that's really important. And part of this is not so much how how is U.S. competing, but how also I, I think the U.S. should compete is focusing on on education, on talent, not just domestically, but also in countries that we're working with. Um, what China has done a very good job of so far is not just training Chinese talent, but training talent in you know African subcontinent, for example, training content you know talent in Southeast Asia that will help that can help Chinese manufacturing or Chinese um, technology initiatives in those countries really flourish in the years to come. And that's something that the U.S. hasn't, I think, done quite as much of in the past. Um, but also leading in terms of innovation and technology, the U.S. still, I think, is very much a leader in innovation. You know, I don't know if China is leading innovation so much as manufacturing production right now, um, but absolutely this is at the forefront of, I think, a lot of multinational companies' minds, the forefront of you know, Silicon Valley's minds. And I think there really is, in the last few years, this complete you know 180 towards 
trade with China, China, you know, um, democracy through trade with China, how can we enter the Chinese market to how do we maintain a relationship, but really first and foremost, protect domestic innovation and talent. Great, thank you. Um, we've mentioned a, a lot here uh, as sort of part of general trade competition, trade war with China, um, examples of economic coercion or attempted economic coercion, different things like that. Um, a question from Cody Ding in the audience. Uh, you know, war, the even trade wars have costs. So can you talk a little bit about how all of these different regulations and, uh, you know, lists in the general competition with China, um, how is that impacting U.S. interests domestically? Yeah, and again, I think that's, this is one of the toughest parts is balancing domestic you know, policy with foreign policy. And we've really seen a lot of retrenchment in the US in recent years too, of people who are questioning, why are we involved here? Why are we providing money to Ukraine? Why are we, you know, supporting Taiwan and all these other countries and all these other places around the world when there is still domestic crises to be solved? Um, and I, I mean, I think that this is really, should be a part of domestic policy. Increasingly, we're seeing governors and mayors have foreign policies as well, because it really does affect domestic, the domestic situation. Um, and this isn't really not a perfect answer just because it it really is so hard. Um, but also when we're talking about allies overseas and partners overseas and being able to retain trust in these relationships, part of that is being able to support them in when it comes to China and being able to prove that we are a reliable partner when it comes to, for example, uh, coercive trade tactics or coercive economic and financial practices that they're facing from China. Um, and so I, I think a lot of domestic re resilience has to do with trust building overseas and retaining these relationships with allies and partners. And we can, this is not really a time, I think, to move away um, from overseas engagement, which again, I'm not sure if the exact question that was asked, but you know, it's, it, it is a really hard balance. And I, I think especially later this year, we're going to see a lot of back and forth be in terms of, you know, how do we balance, again, U.S. competitive overseas, competitive overseas. We've seen this too with China. How do U.S. companies remain competitive if they're moving out of China or they're divesting from China operations? And there's not really a good answer right now, right? How do U.S. companies comp continue to, for example, I've heard people say that operating in China in and of itself is a competitive exercise, right? Because of how quickly things move. And so when companies move away, they're also worried about losing that edge. So again, not, not really a great answer there, but you know, hopefully these are all considerations that are that are part of the conversation. No, absolutely. It's a it's a really hard question, right? There are so many domestic interests and so, you know, whether it's consumers and divesting from China, raising the cost of goods, which impacts inflation or, or you know, all these other things that um, all these other interests combined trying to balance with the foreign policy interests. Um, one sort of follow up question to that. Um, you mentioned, you know, being there for our allies and trying to um, maybe not necessarily go this alone. How much international cooperation are we seeing uh, in terms of, I guess, trying to counter China's growing economic influence? I think we're, we're seeing a lot of, a lot of times it depends on where we're looking at, right? There are countries that are interests that want to continue working with China or buying technology from China, receiving investment from China, because that simply is the best deal. And China shows up and China sh signs the checks, Chinese companies start building the next day. And it's a really great, it, it, it seems to be a great deal for them, right? But there are also more countries, for example, in Latin America and Caribbean that are receiving Chinese investment, but they're also very conscious of, I think, historical values-based ties of the United States and with other Western partners. And so it, it depends on where you're looking um, to kind of understand where, I think where cooperation is going next, but we're also, for example, the Philippines is a country where you're seeing increased cooperation in the China space. I think a lot of countries in, for example, Japan and North and, I'm oh, sorry, and South Korea as well, increasingly in that region, China's I think more adversarial nature or some of China's more military adventurism um, is bringing together countries that historically haven't worked together as much or haven't had as much in incentive to cooperate. And so I think that's, you know, not 
absolutely not a feature of what China is doing overseas. But we there is a lot of interest. For example, Fiji. Um, Fiji before previously had a stronger military relationship with China, or at least policing law enforcement relationship, but recently canceled its uh, police liaison program with China and decided to align a little bit more closely with the U.S. And that was a result of continued and you know increased engagement with Fiji. And I think it goes to show that it's not you know just because a, a country has been working closely with China or has been receiving significant investment, it's not doesn't mean that they're no longer receptive, right, to to like U.S. or to European um, your European. I think cooperation and partnership. I think they're they're looking for what's best for their constituents and what's best for maybe the next election cycle. And if the U.S. continues engaging, the U.S. continues providing providing alternatives. I, I think it, it's still very appealing. Great, thank you. Um, another question from the audience from uh, Phil Bognar. Um, a uh, Taiwan question mark, basically, like, uh, is there anything you can say that would uh, reassure us that um, there is going to be an eventual major confrontation between the U.S. and China centered on Taiwan? Uh, how seriously should we take Xi, Xi Jinping's rhetoric about uh, this being an immediate uh, sort of reunification policy goal? Um, you know, can you can you share any thoughts there? Yeah. I so I believe the Chinese government when they say that their goal is not a forced reunification, reunification in quotation marks, that the goal is a is a um, voluntary sort of situation. And I think there are a lot of things happening behind the scenes that point to that. Right there is China has this I think three prong strategy that involves um, economic integration, emotional integration, social integration with Taiwan. That's everything from providing preferential policies for Taiwanese businesses to operate in China for Taiwanese tourism in China um, to building, for example, a museum. There's a museum that's being built in a province in southern China that uh, seeks to illuminate, I think, Taiwanese people's, um, I think, historic or you know ethnic ties with with China. Um, that would serve, for example, so a sort of social integration purpose and emotional integration. There is a lot, a lot of messaging, um, tour groups or travel hosting students from Taiwan to China, um, and then cultural immersion programs, for example, a really wide range of activities. Um, and ultimately, I think China would prefer that this is, again, a voluntary situation rather than military. And I think military is absolutely the, the last option on the table for, for China, right? Because even though the U.S. has historically framed this as a military situation, at its heart, is a it, it's a diplomatic situation with political, military, and economic considerations. And military is just one of the many, many angles um, and also at the same time, Taiwan would be one war that China absolutely cannot lose. It would be existential for China because for so long, this has been a part of the Chinese rhetoric or then, you know, the national sort of like almost um, the identity in a way um, that or at least through the rhetoric has been, you know, Taiwan is part of China, Taiwan is part of China. And if this was a war that you know, if China ever were to, were to lose, then that would bring a lot of legitimacy questions for the Chinese Communist Party. And that would also potentially embolden places like Hong Kong or some of the autonomous regions or other organized groups in China to also question legitimacy in its strength of the Communist Party. And so, you know, I don't think China wants to fight a war right now. You know, we've seen more some people have called it restraint in the recent incident with the Taiwanese Coast Guard um, and the drowned Chinese fishermen. Um, we also saw relative, I think, restraint after the election. You know, I think there are people who kind of or thought there might be more escalatory behavior by China after William Lai was elected. We didn't see that. Of course, we don't know what's going to happen in May when William Lai is inaugurated. Um, but again, I, I think that the core the core interest really is to remain close to Taiwan, is to continue building those relationships and to erode the Taiwanese people's sense of identity, national identity, and the will to to defend you know, the island nation um, as opposed to an, an imminent military conflict. I think that's really reassuring. Um, I, I wonder a little bit if if they see that like the hearts and minds strategy 
start to fail, how quickly do they then shift? You know, um, and I don't know that there's a, a concrete answer for this, but the younger generation of, Ty of Taiwanese people increasingly identifies as Taiwanese and not Chinese. And I think that's um, a real test for the CCP. Um, yeah, I, any other thoughts there? No, ab absolutely. And I, I think with, with with Taiwan too, this is kind of an evolving conversation. You know, with the recent elections, people had a lot of other other things to vote about. They voted mostly on bread and butter material issues, right? On wages and you know, on on for example, the death penalty was on the ballot this year, right? Where where what the average person cared about. And people care about China. People care about you know bilateral ties and tensions. But that's been just simmering and under the surface for so long. I don't think. So for some people, perhaps it was a, a needle mover, but not for everyone. Um, and I mean, overall for, for China and Taiwan too, there is still the potential, and this is definitely a fear of mine, of a um, miscommunication or miscalculation, miscalcul right? There are sometimes, this has happened throughout history, right? You have maybe a pilot that goes rogue, you have a, you know, an accident on the high seas. Um, we don't really know what could happen as a result of that. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, China has kind of kept the status quo in terms of messaging on China, on Taiwan domestically, if that makes sense. Um, for example, there was very little media reporting, I noticed, about the U.S. high-level delegation visited Taiwan after the election, um, whereas I had expected more incendiary coverage. You know, how could they do this? You know, why why would they recognize Taiwan this way? Or, you know, some very subtle threats. We didn't really see that. It was acknowledged in press conferences. That was about it. So I think there's also China, the Chinese government is trying to manage domestic expectations to an extent, because if the constituents feel that, you know, the next thing that happens could be that's the final straw, or, you know, that is the red line, um, then that's dangerous for the government as well, because they they don't want to there to be this expectation that they would fail to to follow through on. Awesome. Thank you uh, so much for that. Um, another question here from the audience from Bronwyn Morgan. Um, is China's relationship with Russia and Iran becoming a liability or asset to their growth, prosperity, and international reputation? Yeah, I, I think in a way it is, but I'm not sure if China is that concerned, if that makes sense. Um, of course, the, the West, that the U.S., for example, would probably feel the same way regardless of you know which which way China China um voted on on the recent on the crisis um but at the same time for China the focus really is increasingly on the global south right you a lot of the not just investment efforts but political messaging um and the global south is I mean I think Africa comprises well, like 40 percent or some a, a very high percent of you know UN votes Right. And that's what China needs. That's the support that China needs to pass the resolutions that it wants, including resolutions on Taiwan and on Uyghurs. You know, those are the voices that China needs to back it in regional multilateral settings. Um, those are the voices that China wants to work together on to pre provide to present this united front along, you know, when it comes to the U.S. And I don't think China is so much as values aligned with Russia, so much as they have this common, um, you know, interest, again, of when it comes to the U.S. and the West and trying to um, what's the word? Feel, feeling that there has been this level of um, wrongdoing or you know oppression in a way, or China is being held down or constrained or um, you know kept from rising by the West. I think Russia feels that to an extent, but also I don't think it's an unconditional relationship. Whereas Russia might take up arms for China, I'm not sure China would do that for Russia, and so I think it's a very calculated you know relationship. I don't think. Um, I'm, I don't think China is trying to involve itself in any more conflict than it needs to, or to bring any more, um, I think, crisis, you know, to its overseas operations or the people, Chinese people living overseas. Um, but it is, I think, a very carefully maintained sort of relationship. I don't think China was very happy that they didn't have any heads up about the the incursion and the original incursion into Ukraine. Um, I, I don't think I think they they were taken off they were you know off guard, and I think they've been put in into a difficult position. But again these general alignments with Russia, kind of keep it, keep them close, um, and also shared interests, and again, the, in the global south. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, going, we've got maybe time for one or two more questions. Um, 
So I'll, I'll get into uh, one kind of directly from your, your presentation. Uh, the U.S. has, in my opinion, a tendency to start these committees and initiatives and then get tired of paying for them and kind of under-resource them, but expect them to continue to be very efficient. Um, given a growing sort of geostrategic competition uh, with China, continued competition with Russia, um, growing concerns about some other countries as well, does uh, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S actually receive enough resources to effectively do its job? Uh, you know, how, how would you handle that? I, you know, I, I think that the, what's tricky with, with CFIUS um, in part is that it, they rely on voluntary reporting of transactions that have taken place. With that said, they also have proactively investigated and, you know, pulled um, filings and asked for more clarification for companies. So I think they they have you know received an infusion of resources in you know very recently. I think they've really built out the team, and right now with the with the new outbound investment program as well, there there has been I think quite a bit of quite a bit of hiring. Um, and so I think the the U.S. is very much aware of this need to bolster resources in this area. Um, but the I think one of the key gaps is still again the wiring between all of the different programs and agencies, right? However, I think a lot of teams are probably doing some of the same research into some of the same companies and into some of the same same issue areas. Um, but that's that's a question that's you know not not necessarily I don't think we're going to resolve anytime soon is how how do we get more more programs and agencies to share funding or to work together. Um, but with all of the all the agencies now have China missions, have China houses, have China departments, um, really is an emphasis for the US government. And I, I think we're going to see a lot more here. Great. Well, uh, Claire, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to uh, wrap up there. Um, I want to I'll do a brief spiel about the World Affairs Council, and then I'll turn it back over to you for any closing thoughts. So if there's anything specific you would like us to take away or optimism that you'd like to, hopefully optimism you'd like us to take away from this, um, you know, I'll, I'll throw it back to you in a second. Uh, but I do want to remind our audience that the World Affairs Council of St. Louis uh, is a great co-sponsor for these events um, and that they rely on donations and memberships to continue to provide uh, these sorts of opportunities. So please consider becoming a member uh, today. Uh, Claire, I'll give it back to you for the any final thoughts, last word. Yeah, I'm, I don't think I have a, a ton to add because we, we've had a great discussion here today and a lot of really interesting questions, um, but I'm just, I'm really glad, you know, thank you for having me on. And if anyone's interested in this area or the work that I do, I think it's such an emerging area, especially for students and for, you know, researchers starting out in this space is this very inter interdisciplinary sort of view on China. So happy to answer questions or be a resource um, for folks that want to reach out but again, thanks again for, for listening. And um, yeah, ho hopefully there will be more discussions on, on this topic, related topics to come. I think there are a lot of different, each of the sections from today's presentation probably could have been their own um, hour long presentation, right? So I think there's a lot to explore and I'm glad that we're getting into it. Great. Claire, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we really appreciate you being here um, and hope to run into you again in, in the future. Great, thanks again. Thanks.